Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's webinar covering the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's December report titled Waste Incineration, A Dirty Secret and How States Define Renewable Energy. Uh, Marie Donahue, a research associate with our Energy Democracy Initiative at LSR, uh, will be presenting today, connecting the dots across our waste and energy initiatives. Um, she'll be digging into the economic and environmental impacts of power generating waste incinerators and she'll be explaining why waste incinerator incinerators don't belong in um, the legal definitions of renewable energy. Uh, a few logistical notes, we are recording the webinar if you need to hop off or if you'd like to share it with a colleague after the session, we'll be posting it to our website at ilsr.org. Um, we'll also have time for some questions at the end of today's presentation, so please add your questions in the question box on your control panel, uh, should be on the right hand side of your screen and we'll get to those at the end. Um, you can also chat us to let us know if you're having any technical issues. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Marie. All right, thanks, Simba. Uh, I'm pleased to join everyone today. Thanks so much for uh, um, joining us on the webinar. Um, in addition to my talk today about the report, uh, we're joined by a couple representatives from uh, great wor organizations working on incineration. Um, and I, do know that ICO is on the line already and uh, hopefully Mike will be joining us, but we have um, Gaia, a worldwide alliance whose ultimate vision is a just toxic free world without incineration. And then the Energy Justice Network, which is a national support network for grassroots community groups uh, fighting dirty energy and waste in industry facilities. Uh, so those two organizations will share their perspectives and, and great work in this field with us today as well. Um, and they've been just important leaders in fighting waste incineration. So it's really valuable to have their perspective and the years of work that both of those organizations have, have brought to this, this topic that we're, um, and the research that uh, we were working on at ILSR. Um, and so our, our guests are Aiko here on, on the left from Gaia, who will kick us off today with some opening remarks and kind of set the stage. Um, I'll follow with a, highlighting the, the work that our research that we um, put together in this report, and then uh, have Mike Ewall, uh, founder and director of the Energy Justice Network, follow my presentation, hopefully provide some updates on some of his uh, grassroots organizing and involvement. Um, there's some ongoing updates that we may have from him um, in, in Baltimore uh, on some recent developments there in city council and like local policy work that will be interesting to dig into. So um, before we begin, uh, Hiba and I are uh, going to be having a couple poll questions throughout to keep folks engaged. So, uh, so I just wanted to first test that technology with a kind of fun question here. Um, our Energy Democracy uh, Initiative Director, John Farrell, always uh, likes this question in webinars. So um, we'll do uh, how many tabs you have open currently in your browser. Um, and Hiba will add this. Uh, yeah, hopefully you'll see the question that you can participate in. Uh, we'll wait a few moments for that, for you all to be able to figure out the way to put your answers in. Um, but we have a, a range of, if you're focusing just on this webinar, great. If you are multitasking, that's all right too. And then um, maybe a little bit before my time in some ways, but uh, if you are familiar with the tab, uh, Cola, you can answer that too. Um, I guess we'll see if, uh, yep, and Hibba pulled up the results here. Um, so yeah, a few few of you, kind of a nice spread between a few tabs and, and quite a number. Um, so anyway, it looks like folks understood how to participate in polls. We'll have some more serious and related questions, um, including this, this next one here. So we have, um, just to get us started, to um, see where we're all at with a sort of baseline understanding, and if you, uh, did check out the report, maybe you have the answer to this already, but uh, in our research we did try to look at existing databases of waste incinerators and we were wondering how many um, power generating municipal solid waste incinerators are currently operating in the U.S. Um, and so you can put your guesses or your answer into uh, to the number of waste incinerators that are currently in the U.S. Um, and I would say that our report, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but we focused on specifically incinerators that are processing municipal solid waste and then also producing energy. And we'll talk a little bit more about those definitions. Some of what Gaia and uh, Energy Justice Network works on encompasses um, some other types of incinerators as well, but just to 
clarify that we're focusing on, on those today. Um, all right, and it looks like indeed that the majority of you got the correct answer, uh, which is the 76 plants. Um, some are in the process. There are a couple that are kind of in the process of closing and um, or they're just sort of, um, but yeah, that 76 number uh, is close to the, the most current that we have. Um, so thanks for participating. Let's see. So next, we will just turn it over to. Um, so I'm advancing my slides here. All right. Uh, we'll hear for a few minutes from Aiko Fukuchi, who is the regional program associate for the Guy US program. Uh, they live in Detroit, Michigan, and have previous experience working on environmental justice issues, focusing on air quality and water accessibility and justice. Uh, in addition to their environmental work, ICO has contributed to work in other areas, including workers' rights, LGBTQ liberation and justice, and anti-oppressive organizing strategies. Uh, ICO's primary role at Gaia is facilitating the, facili the Failing Incinerators Project uh, and supporting Gaia membership. Um, again, this is a nonprofit that does uh, coordinate across uh, globally uh, communities fighting waste incineration, so it's a great network in that way. Uh, thanks again for joining us, Psycho, and uh, looking forward to hearing a little bit more about Gaia's work and setting the stage for us today. So I'll switch over. I know you have a few slides, um, and Hibba will, I think, make your mic live. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Um, can y'all hear me? Yes, I think we're... Okay, cool. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marie and Hibba. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you so much to ILSR for both releasing this incredible report um, and in such an intentional way with the webinar and everything. I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and thank you for, for inviting Guy to speak. Um, so just to give a little bit of information about Gaia, if you haven't heard about us, um, Gaia is a worldwide alliance. We have members who are grassroots organizers, researchers, zero waste experts, um, folks working on anti-incineration, waste reduction, and zero waste efforts um, in many different capacities in over 90 countries around the world. Um, we all, all, our members, what we have in common is that we all share common goals of building a future free from all forms of incineration um, and also absent of the misuse of finite resources with a strong presence of zero waste systems. So um, that's a little bit of information about Gaia. I'm going to give a little bit of, um, if you could go to the next slide, Marie, sorry, I forgot to mention. Um, so the next slide um, gives basically just a little bit of an overview around waste incineration. Um, so approximately 76 incinerators are in operation in the U.S. Um, we already talked about that, so it's great. Um, and when we talk about incineration, we're not just talking about incinerate facilities that are called incinerators only. We're also talking about waste to energy facilities or facilities that are so-called waste to energy, uh, pyrolysis, gasification. There are many different forms that incineration takes, um, but all of these are considered under the umbrella of incineration. Um, some of the core impacts of incineration incinerators are uh, they're toxic to public health. They have um, a lot of pollutants, including dioxins, particulate matter, cadmium, arsenic, uh, chromium, uh, mercury, lead, and um, acidic gases as well. And they're harmful to the economy, environment, and climate through their emissions. Uh, they're the most expensive uh, facilities to run for energy um, past any other options that we have. Um, so uh, after that, I want to talk a little bit really quickly about uh, some of the kind of quick history behind incineration in the U.S. So in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there was a huge push to build uh, new incinerators in the U.S. Uh, over 300 of these incineration proposals were stopped thanks to uh, groups like IS ILSR and folks uh, who work with ILSR and uh, are on their staff, like Brenda Platt, have done really incredible work over the years. Um, so the majority of these proposals uh, were stopped and were not able to move forward, though around 100 of them uh, were built um, and are kind of known now as uh, some of our legacy incinerators that we have here in the United States. Um, recently, um, what else? Oh, and the last thing I want to mention was kind of just a quick note on ash. Um, so 
I think a lot of the conversations that I've I've had recently have um, been talking about pollution controls around air emissions and air pollution of waste incinerators. Um, and I've had a lot of folks ask, you know, well, if we just have better pollution controls, then these facilities are fine, right? Um, and one one clear clear reason why that is not the case is because the the stronger uh, the air pollution controls are, um, the more hazardous the ash becomes. So when you have filtration devices on on these facilities that um, reduce air emissions, those toxins don't just go away. Uh, they're still produced by the incinerator. They're just uh, pushed down into the ash rather than up into the air. Um, most of this ash is, or much of it is landfilled. Um, there's also been some some other kind of hazardous and risky practices around around ash use um, and uh, disposing of ash as well. Um, so once once ash is created, once it's landfilled, there are risks of breathing it in. A lot of um, times we've seen we've heard cases of ash being used to cover as um, used uh, in landfills as kind of a covering, even used as liners, uh, which can leak into the, which can and do eventually uh, leak into the soil and groundwater. Water. Um, we've also heard of attempts um, made to convert incinerator ash into products such as roadbeds or cement blocks. Um, we've heard cases of Kavanta, uh, a major incinerator company in the U.S., um, paying local farmers to use ash as fertilizer supplement. Um, and one thing that's that's very um, pretty scary about all of this is um, is that some it has been done in the past where the use of ash has been considered a method for recycling. So as a lot of cities right now are um, looking to increase their recycling rates, um, there is a risk that some of them will look towards the use of ash in potentially these ways um, through um, to increase their recycling. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit quickly on ash to talk about it because I don't I don't think it is discussed enough. Um, all right, so um, Marie, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So these are some of the main projects that uh, Gaia US is working on right now. Uh, the first one labeled here is the failing incinerators project. That's the main project that I'm working on. The Failing Incinerators Project is an effort that Gaia is partnering with other, other organizations who are on the ground um, in communities where some of these legacy incinerators are located to shut these facilities down. Um, so currently we have partners in Long Beach, California, in Baltimore, and in Detroit, Michigan. So that's one of the bigger projects. Um, Another project that we're working on is we're working with a coalition, a large coalition of folks uh, to expand some of the break free from plastics work that has been happening globally. Um, one of the bigger portions that Gaia is involved in is with their zero waste communities working group. So these are really efforts to both reduce um, plastic production and also increase zero waste in communities. And then lastly, Gaia does a lot of work supporting our members um, through resources and, and other forms of support, media, um, and networking opportunities, convenings, um, Skillshare, uh, different things like that. In addition to that, we also do research. If you're interested in any of our work, you can go to our website, which I've listed at the bottom of this presentation. Um, all right, Marie, if you could go to the next slide. Great, thank you. So this is pretty much the last thing I want to talk about. I just wanted to um, speak to one specific example that I thought was relevant, especially um, in this webinar today, is the shutdown of the Commerce Incinerator. Um, the Commerce Incinerator in California shut down um, June 30th uh, last year. And I wanted to talk about some of the key points of strategy. Um, so some of that, that had to do with uh, RPS and um, so I'll just start, I guess. So California in 2002 passed their renewable portfolio standard. Um, this, their RPS did not include incineration, um, except for in one specific case. So fast forward to the past few years. We know that 
incinerators are some of the most expensive facilities to run. So you have in facilities like the Commerce Incinerator and the Long Beach Incinerator um, really desperately trying to um, acquire financial support from government entities. And so one of the ways in which they tried to do this, one of their key strategies was to was through uh, Assembly Bill 655. And what that would have done was it would have made it so that uh, it would have included incineration in California's renewable portfolio standard. Um, but through incredible work, collective work um, done by, you know, so collaboratively by so many environmental leaders, zero waste leaders, grassroots community members, um, including uh, East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice, ILSR and Gaia, um, just to name a few, many letters were sent um, and a lot of intentional action was put towards opposing these bills. And um, last in 2017, April of 2017, the bill was voted on um, and it did not pass. Um, and about a year later, the Commerce Incinerator shut down. So that's a pretty um, clear and exciting example, I would say, of, of how uh, how important talking about uh, renewable portfolio standards, renewable energy in terms of incineration really is um, to, to discussing these facilities and, and how, to, how to close them. So I think that's, that's all I had to present. Thank you so much, Marie and ILSR, and I will pass it back to you. Oh, sorry, this is one last thing. If you are interested in any Gaia resources, uh, our latest report is Incinerators in Trouble, which you can find on our website, uh, shown below. Thank you. Thanks, Aiko. Um, lots of great resources. As I mentioned, Guy has been doing this work for decades as well, and we're just so great, grateful to have uh, that perspective and, and all of your work today. Um, all right, so I think we'll keep this rolling. Um, and we did uh, at least see that Mikey Wall from Energy Justice Network, who we mentioned as our third uh, presenter today, did join. Um, and I just want to remind attendees that uh, we'll be, um, or if you have questions for any of us throughout the, the webinar, you can just post them as we go in the questions box. Um, and Hiba will be tracking those and we'll bring, come back to them at the end when we open it up for the discussion. Um, all right, so um, as Iko mentioned, uh, incineration is a, a quite dirty form of it's a combustion process and energy is one of the um, sort of ways it's been able to to continue in, in some ways but um, but it is a predominantly waste management tool that um, and these facilities are, are often um, especially the existing ones quite quite old and um, I appreciated that history so I just wanted to to make sure that we're sort of all on the same page a little bit about just a quick visual of the process. You have um, municipal solid waste being dropped off in at the incineration facility. Um, that is then combusted um, and produce, uh, produces steam. And then that electricity that's generated um, or steam are used um, in, in some cases either at the facility or then sold to the grid or to the local um, utility or, or city through power purchase agreements. Um, and I appreciated um, just the leadership of, of so I, as maybe taking a step back, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and our teams here, um, I work with our Energy Democracy Initiative. Um, and this was a nice sort of project to be able to connect the dots between our work looking at energy um, and then also the leadership. Um, Iko mentioned Brenda Platt and then also our co-founder, uh, Neil Seldman, who been working just extensively on, on waste related, um, both recycling and compost related initiatives for decades. So um, definitely nodding to uh, to their leadership and, and uh, help in support, supporting this project and report as well. Um, and in the process of putting that report together and focusing sort of on the, the connections between municipal solid waste incineration and energy, uh, I did interview Neil and, and we spoke at length. Um, I appreciated this quote uh, just about the terms used uh, to describe this process. Um, and from his perspective, he says, we refer to incineration as wasted energy or a waste of energy because this process really burns up more energy than it produces. Uh, incineration's often, and in, in some ways, been actively um, rebranded by the industry uh, as waste to energy or sort of framed as this uh, really positive uh, in terms of the energy it produces. But I think we'll, we'll dig into why uh, that's, um, 
maybe, yeah, again, kind of greenwashing this otherwise quite dirty process um, and not an economical one at that uh, for our energy use. Uh, so we have another poll here uh, to make sure you're all paying attention. Um, uh, curious if, if you can weigh in on, on which forms of the following electricity generation um, sources are clean and renewable. We have option A of wind, B, waste incineration, C, natural gas, D, solar, or E, A, and D. Give you a few minutes just to get your responses in. A few seconds, I mean. <laughs> All right, so maybe close that out. Uh, and Fortunately, most of you all uh, did answer them the way that we, we would here at ILSR is that it would be D, wind and solar. Um, if you don't agree that, and, and fortunately it doesn't look like anyone put waste incineration on there. If, if anyone had maybe this webinar, uh, hopefully you would learn some things from, from this webinar and we'd be able to convince you. But I'm glad that we're um, maybe on the same page, but hope you can still learn some things about the process and, and why we need to be supporting uh, solar and wind over incineration throughout uh, today. So uh, to map some of the existing uh, plants and just to get a sense of where the, um, the capacity of these plants are, this map is somewhat out of date, but it just wanted to illustrate uh, where incinerators are located throughout the US. Um, and uh, again, I mentioned earlier the 76 plants that we have in our, our list um, that was collected using information from a database that Energy Justice Network manages and some other sources, um, again, with some um, plant closures in, as uh, Eiko mentioned, the Commerce California one, for example, some of these plants are, are starting to ramp, ramp down, but um, still in quite a number of them distributed throughout the, the country. Um, Next, in terms of sort of the, the share of, as I mentioned, this is related to both waste and energy. Uh, in terms of the waste side of the equation, uh, we see incineration accounting for 13% of uh, total US municipal solid waste generation in terms of the end process of its disposal. In 2015, those are the latest numbers from the US EPA. Um, and uh, I, I would just note that um, more than 90% of the materials disposed using incinerators in landfills, which account here, as you can see, 66% in, in landfilling and incineration combined, uh, could instead be cost effectively reused, recycled, or, and composted, uh, according to other research that our team, the community composting and uh, waste to wealth teams at ILSR have put together. So um, it's a significant portion that, that really could be shifted toward um, those other two categories of compost and recycling um, as alternatives. So um, when we think about those alternatives, uh, another poll question here, how many or how much energy uh, can be saved by using alternatives such as recycling and composting as compared to incinerators? Uh, would incineration save more energy than those in option A? Uh, one to two times more saved from recycling and composting compared to incinerators, three to five times more, or six to eight times more. Just to wrap that up, kind of keeping you on your toes, trying to get through a lot of things today. So um, looks like most of you said six to eight times more, but we do have actually the, the correct answer would be uh, C, three to five times more. And I'll show you a visual and we'll walk through um, an example of why that is next. Um, so here we have uh, an incineration versus recycling comparison, looking at the um, life cycle uh, or embodied energy that is um, managed as we treat one ton of paper. So um, paper is a, a very valuable resource. We use it in a lot of our day-to-day um, -day lives. Um, and it comes from trees. And so there is a lot of embodied energy in processing and developing virgin paper um, to source, manufacture, and transport that for our consumption. Um, but when that paper is burned at an incinerator, um, that, that incinerator can generate about 8,200 megajoules of energy. Um, however, if that paper was instead recycled, uh, that that saving of paper, and, and again, thinking about all of the um, upstream sort of life cycle 
um, energy that's embodied within the paper, um, recycling it would save 35,200 megajoules. So you get that three to five uh, times amount through that type of analysis, looking at the life cycle assessment of um, of paper. So that sort of gives you a comparison as to why essentially when we're um, burning things and have no other way of then reusing and, and reducing our consumption that like that's a sort of dead end, whereas recycling and composting can re be more regenerative and, and save us energy in the long run. Uh, another key finding of our report is that the economics of these incinerator incinerators don't add up. Um, as, as was mentioned in um, touched on earlier, uh, these are risky invest investments. They're large centralized plants that are um, that did require, in, in many cases when they were built in the 70s, 80s, 90s, large upfront investments by the communities they were in, um, often through large amounts of debt uh, um, obligations and, um, and then continue to be costly in their operation. Um, and as uh, then energy prices and, and tip fees, which are the two sources, ma or major sources of sort of income for these plants, as those um, have gotten, uh, have, uh, as those have adjusted over time, um, these plants aren't able to be covering their costs and at, at risk to ta taxpayers in that way. And so, um, yeah, as, as solar wind have become more cost competitive, uh, we see more and more incinerators struggling to uh, maintain their uh, power purchase agreements with utilities and with, with the cities that they're in. So um, just a couple examples of some of the that sort of upfront debt, just kind of draw, um, again, emphasizing the issues with investing in large centralized plants. We have um, a couple examples we highlight in the report, including uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where there's this pretty dire uh, um, plan of the city that, or the, the plan that ended up in quite dire circumstances for the city where um, Harrisburg and the county took on $125 million in debt obligations in, in the year 2000 to rep retrofit the existing utility or the existing incinerator that had been built um, in the 70s. Uh, and those retrofits were quite costly. They failed to perform to the projections set by the um, operator that was sort of asking for these investments be made, uh, that those be made. Um, the city and county kept continuing to add additional investments with to no avail and eventually in uh, in the midst of um, the Great Recession and aftermath, the city was driven into bankruptcy in, in large part because of these debt obligations from the, uh, the incinerator. So that's a kind of cautionary tale about these big kind of central centralized investments and whether they, they really would end up um, paying off through, through the um, just significant amount of the obligations that are required for the big improvements um, to keep up with uh, their quality controls and other things. Um, and then Hennepin County is another example, or the HERC, uh, Hennepin County Energy Resource or uh, Energy Recovery Center, uh, required in 2010, for example, it, it wasn't able to meet its costs through the tip fees and other and energy produced. So it required a $1.8 million subsidy from county, from the county and, and ultimately taxpayers. So um, that was about a $5 per ton of waste uh, cost. And it um, just, again, indicates that a lot, oftentimes taxpayers are left on the hook to pay for these facilities that private operators are convincing city officials and the public that they will um, that they should remain open. But whether uh, that's good investment for our tax dollars, uh, it doesn't seem like in many of these cases to be paying off. So. Um, and just in terms of some other economic angles to this, incinerators are, when you compare on jobs numbers, uh, alternative waste management strategies also end up coming out ahead. Uh, composting sites, for example, based on, again, not some other ILSR analysis, uh, can create four, four times the number of local jobs uh, than waste incinerators. Um, and on the tip fees side, I've mentioned that a couple times. So these are the fees that waste disposal haulers uh, pay to be able to dump dump the trash, the municipal solid waste at the facility um, that are then ultimately passed down to cities and customers and the, the rates that they pay for waste disposal. But um, the cost of those are often two to three times higher than comparable recycling or composting rates. Um, so that again, increases these costs of disposal uh, that municipalities face in the long run. 
Um, and we illustrate this on this slide here and two examples of Baltimore and Hennepin County. And you can just see the significant amount of savings uh, on an annual basis that would come from diverting, uh, the, again, the amount of waste here um, away from incineration and into more sustainable waste management practices. So uh, in addition to the economic uh, angles of this, we have a classic case of environmental injustice with these uh, combustion facilities. Uh, they generate, as Iko mentioned, harmful pollu pollutants that do put the public uh, surrounding the and nearby communities at risk um, for to human health. So, um, yeah, we we talked a bit about the dioxins, the lead, the mercury, uh, and um, then also climate uh, impacts of greenhouse gas emissions in both biogenic sources and carbon dioxide, um, as well as then the hazardous ash, the, the toxic ash that's left after the, the burning of the solid waste. So all of that, um, again, is sort of important to keep in mind from an environmental and social justice aspect or angle. Um, and then what's worse is that these incinerators are disproportionately located in areas directly impacted um, by other burdens and, um, and that predominantly in, in low-income areas and or disproportionately at least in low-income and areas and those with um, people of predominantly people of color neighborhoods which we see through some analysis that the energy justice network has um, and some interactive online tools that i'd encourage folks to check out this justicemap.org um, this first chart shows the the demographics and the related to the distance to these plants so as in this race ratio on the side just indicates that um, the average density of the uh, racial and ethnic groups on the side, um, that there is that spike. And we see um, that, especially within the half mile distance between plants, that there is just a significant spike in um, minority populations and people of color uh, near these sites. So that translates then to higher exposure um, of the pollutants they produce. Um, and one example of this uh, is certainly very evident in Detroit, where we see um, here a panel with the census blocks of race and specifically um, African-American communities around the incinerator um, in, in a place. And then the next slide is income. We see this um, in Detroit. So much of the waste that's processed at that plant is actually being um, brought in from outside of the city limits from um, more affluent and, and, and more higher proportion of white communities. So um, again, just driving home this example of where uh, incinerators have been such a um, problematic environmental justice issue uh, in the communities that they are in. And finally, the main, uh, and, and in some ways kind of drawing that back to then energy related work um, and that renewable connection. Um, we argue in the report that renewable trash is an oxymoron and uh, we have sort of all these complex issues connected to incineration, but, um, but how has the industry really managed to stay afloat as these plants are becoming um, older and older? Um, we know that there are these clear other alternatives for waste management. We know renewable technologies are becoming more economical. Um, and that so, so waste incineration really is this incredibly expensive and inefficient way of managing our waste and energy. So um, one of the, the trends that we found and just seeing what was out there in the, the literature was around how um, they persist because of um, policies that have enabled them at the state and federal level to label um, trash burning as renewable uh, energy. And so that has sort of allowed um, that designation has allowed for incinerators that might otherwise not have um, as much support to continue to get some subsidies to kind of, again, be bolstered by, uh, by an otherwise sort of dying industry, hopefully. Um, so anyway, we uh, wanted to ask what our, I think, final poll question perhaps of today is how many US states classify waste incineration as renewable in their energy goals and standards? We have uh, none, five, 16, 23, or 43 states. I know, just being mindful of time, we'll move th through this quickly as well. Um, looks pretty close, uh, but I can't. Is there a tie, I guess? And that, so the 
example here is, is pretty small on my screen, but um, so most of you, it looks like either said 16 or 23. Uh, the correct answer is 23 states from our, our count. Um, and we'll show you this visual on the next slide um, as to why we, um, we drew from a variety of different data sources. So there's the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Database of State Incentives for Renewable and Efficiency or DESIRE uh, Energy Justice Network. This, there was a great new report in the last year as well from Food and Water Watch that covers a similar topic, um, state statutes and statutes themselves, and then the Energy Recovery Council. All of those um, we kind of compiled information to understand where states had either state formal renewable portfolio standards, uh, which are sort of defined terms. Um, to find goals that have kind of clear deadlines. Um, some states have less, um, less specific, but still sort of aspirational goals for energy, renewable energy, and those we included here as well. Um, and then in, in some cases, there's either an explicit allowance of incineration, um, or in some case, it might be under certain conditions. Um, so, so that is where we get this count of of states and those are indicated in red here and in the parentheses you see the number of incinerators in each state. Um, and then we do have a few then states that um, are explicitly excluding municipal solid waste. They may allow other uh, other types of incineration. So as Iko mentioned there are a number of other forms of incineration that we didn't cover in this report but that might um, still be allowed. And then there are a couple of states that have explicitly banned municipal solid waste incineration. Um, or states that don't have necessarily defined statewide renewable goals or definitions um, as well in gray. So uh, really interesting sort of map to dig into. And um, we see that 52 out of the 76 operating plants, or so the majority of these plants are located in states that classify uh, municipal solid waste as renewable, um, which is problematic in terms of being a way to continue to subsidize this sturdy form of energy. Uh, and, and then in, in addition to the states that have explicit goals or that allow waste incineration to be counted, um, when we think about the, the mechanisms of, uh, of the, or, and just the way the grid is structured, um, an incineration facility could conceivably be counting as renewable in one state and that out of state renewable energy credit could be bought in states around. And so um, we think about, we can think about the ways in which those states in red that are classifying um, this power as renewable might be propping up facilities um, and then also affecting the nearby states as well. Um, so important to keep that in mind. Um, so we conclude the report then, um, acknowledging that this is an issue and we need to, um, and that we do have uh, actionable ways of uh, investing in healthier and more economical uh, and ultimately more sustainable waste and energy uh, strategies. Um, so our first recommendation, though, is to for communities and advocates and state lawmakers, local officials, when they're creating policies that have renewable energy goals, to to remove incineration explicitly from those definitions of what counts. Um, we want to make sure we're all supporting grassroots campaigns fighting incinerators locally, uh, like within the network of Gaia and some of those projects I mentioned, and then we'll hear from um, Mike as well. Um, on the waste management side, uh, ILSR advocates for um, incentive-based approaches like pay as you throw a unit pricing on waste that would help customers reduce the amount of things they're throwing away, reduce that sort of upstream supply of waste. Uh, and on the sort of downstream side, you can think about um, better ways of supporting organics recycling, community composting programs uh, that really are based in the local economy, uh, supporting local entrepreneurs and keeping um, both the soil and our local economies healthy through um, that zero waste, those zero waste approaches. And then on the recycling side, thinking about ways of making sure that that process is efficient through dual stream uh, programs, recovering valuable materials, separating paper and reducing disposal costs that way. And then our energy democracy team certainly is our big proponents of distributed uh, energy resources. So um, as those costs of those technologies continue to decrease, they'll become more accessible. Cities especially um, are in a position to um, address their own 
local energy needs, set an example for their communities by putting solar panels on municipal buildings um, instead of investing in um, purchasing power from a nearby incinerator. So lots of uh, existing alternatives that uh, we think um, make a whole lot more sense than investing in outdated technology. Um, and with that, I'm going to switch it over quickly to um, Mike Ewall to um, speak with us a little bit about his work uh, and the network that he leads. Um, so Mike is the founder and director of the Energy Justice Network. Uh, and um, I did ask and sort of hope he can frame this if he's willing to, to talk a little bit more specifically about what's happening in, in Baltimore with a new um, policy proposal that has on, is on the table there, um, thinking about the ways we can kind of think about how local policy can enable or help push push back against incinerators. So Mike, I'll turn it over to you. Feel free to give a little bit of an overview of EJN too. Great, thank you, Marie. Um, can everyone hear me? I think you're good, yeah. And I'll be yeah. muting myself too. <laughs> Great. Um, so I don't know how to share my screen or if I should do PowerPoint, but Megan, if you want, I did just email you a version um, that's shorter that you can use. Um, but if that takes me, I'll just walk through. Um, what I have notes on right now. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Mike Ewall. I'm the founder and director of Energy Justice Network. We're a national group based in Philadelphia and I live in some combination of DC and Philadelphia and travel a lot. Um, we were founded in um, 1999, so we're now 20 years old. Um, been fighting incinerators um, since I was in high school, actually in the early 1990s. And um, one of the things that relates to the side that ILSR does more work on, which is the zero waste and solution side, um, actually developed a zero waste hierarchy that has then been adopted by the city of Oakland, California, and now is used by the Zero Waste International Alliance, and is used as a global standard for what zero waste means. And that's something that was just redefined recently. Um, so I would encourage everyone to check out the Zero Waste International Alliance um, webpage, cwia.org. Um, we also have a copy of it up at energyjustice.net slash zero waste if you want to see what the latest hierarchy looks like. And what's important about that is we recently got it redefined, so that's not just about not burning and not burying, but prioritizing the not burning, because we know from research we've done and just general knowledge around this issue that incineration with ash landfilling is actually worse than simply landfilling it directly. So. Oh, and here's a picture of the hierarchy, <laughs> thank you. Um, so we're the leading group that's been working to support communities in the U.S. stopping proposed incinerators and to close existing ones in the U.S. We're currently working with over a dozen communities right now, reviving opposition to existing facilities because there have been so many proposals defeated that we don't have many proposals left to fight. So it's nice to be turning the tide and really working on shutting down the existing um, generation of trash incinerators. Um, 76 is no longer even the correct number. Um, the industry put out a recent directory just a couple months ago. It now says 75. Um, two of those announced that they're planning to close in the next year. Another one is technically closed right now because of generator failures, and hopefully we'll be keeping that closed for good. Um, so thanks, Maria, for moving on, on our PowerPoint. Um, so that's a map on our website um, that you can find of the existing trash incinerators. Um, a couple of those we'll need to mark as closed soon. And this is an interactive site that you can use to, um, as one of our three main mapping tools that we have. And you can use it to put any proposed facilities on there or put your group and your, you as an individual on the site, say that which facilities you're fighting. Other people can then find you and connect with you if you want. You can share materials through it. There are a lot of features on it, and we can help train and walk people through how to use it. Um, so we have a 12-point plan that we've been using with our member groups to close existing incinerators. I can't get into all that right now, but I'm happy to work with local communities on it as we've been doing. Um, we've also, and um, some of the slides in here, if you want to walk through them, I can explain. But um, we've been basically making the argument that trash incineration is the most expensive and the most polluting way to manage waste or to make energy. That means it's more expensive than any form of electric generation. That's something that the federal government admitted, the Energy Information Administration. Um, the slide um, currently being shown is the mouthpiece for the incinerator industry. When I was testifying right next to him in the DC City Council uh, five, six years ago, and he admitted that I was right about trash incineration being more expensive than landfilling. 
the other two boxes are being more polluting. And we've shown that trash incineration is more polluting than coal even, using EPA and industry data. Um, these are the numbers on how much worse it is than coal, and we have all of that documented on that website there. If you just go to energyjustice.net slash incineration, you'll find a link to this page and, and several others that relate to it. Um, there's also the research we put together showing that incineration is worse than landfills, and that's some of the most recent stuff that we put together. Um, we did that in a life cycle assessment about a year and a half ago. Um, Marie, if you want to jump to the slide with all the 10 charts at once, yes, <laughs> that's one. Um, so this is the summary slide of 10 different slides in a longer presentation that shows that by 10 different environmental criteria, when we compared for Washington, D.C., incinerating at one of the biggest incinerators in the country in Norton, Virginia, in the community of color, one of the most diverse in the country, um, very huge polluter. Incinerating there or shipping it two to four times as far to landfills in southeastern Virginia, we found that even with the trucking, which turned out to be pretty insignificant, the difference between the red and blue lines on there are the twice or four times as far to get to landfills. So you can see the lack of a gap between the red and blue bars. That's the, the gap is the, the trucking emissions, and you don't see much of a gap. But you see that most of them, the yellow line, which is the incinerator, is far worse than the others. So for six out of 10 criteria, incineration is worse. All the major criteria, um, the big ones with the biggest numbers, incineration turns out to be worse. There are three that landfills are worse on because incinerators don't tend to release ozone depleters and a couple other categories here, and one that's basically a tie. Um, so this is now research that we can rerun for other communities if they need to prove to their local officials that incineration with ash filling is worse than simply using the landfill directly. We're able to put numbers to this now. We've also been looking at cost, which is usually cheaper to landfill than incinerate. Jobs, which ILSR has done a great job showing that you get more jobs even from landfilling, of course, way more than um, incineration if you recycle and do the right things, but even landfilling gives you 83% more jobs. And in terms of the population impacted and the race and class of those people, especially by race, demographics around it, they're usually worse in the case of incinerators as well. Um, there's actually Marie already uh, stole the thunder from me on some things, thank you, um, on the demographic slides. So we don't have to show those right now, um, but I'm happy to share our mapping tools with that if you need to see the demographics and make an or environmental justice case on certain facilities. Um, so let's walk through a few other things Marie wanted me to talk about and some that she didn't ask me to talk about. <laughs> but um, she brought up Harrisburg. I'll point out that it was in um, 2000 that we started working on Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So that was the most dioxin polluting trash incinerator in the country and the longest running since 1972. And their dioxin pollution reaches as far as the Canadian Arctic. And those environmental facts didn't shake the city at all. So I did an economic analysis and showed them that if they invested that money in a new incinerator and basically rebuilding the thing with everything but the stack um, being replaced, that it would drive the city into bankruptcy. Eight years later, in 2011, the city went bankrupt. And I got to say, I told you so, but it didn't feel very good. Um, so we see a lot of the financial problems and a lot of other ones as well. That's just the worst of the horror stories. Now, um, since the report um, I also just did was on renewable portfolio standards. I'll say a few words on what we're doing on that, and then I'll move into Baltimore and our local fights and wrap it up. Um, the work that we're doing in Maryland on that, Maryland is the first state to put trash incineration equal to wind in a renewable portfolio standard. And actually, Marie, there's a slide with the light bulb um, picture on it, if you can move to that. There you go. Um, this shows that in 2011, when um, Martin O'Malley, who wanted to become our president as the Democratic candidate, he was the governor of Maryland at the time, and he signed off um, while I was sitting in an trash and scenario industry conference, which was celebrating this at the very time that he signed that bill into law and took $100,000 from the industry to his Democratic Governors Association that I chaired at the time. They moved trash incineration from tier two to tier one. And this is the economic impact of that, that the amount of money those incinerators were getting skyrocketed as soon as it was put on the same tier as wind power in one of these renewable portfolio standard laws. This is a very dangerous thing to be doing. We're looking at now incinerators getting about two to $5 million a year in Maryland and one in Northern Virginia that's also eligible for Maryland's program. 
and we're thankfully close. We've been working on this for several years now to getting the Maryland legislature to remove renewable energy credits for trash incineration. And we're also trying to get biomass, landfill gas, and all the other dirty energy out, not just burning trash, which some groups are content to stop at. Um, now, this idea has been attempted in several other states. So you need to be watchdogging your state legislature to make sure that they're not trying to enhance renewable energy credits for trash incineration by moving into tier or class one or by other means. Recently, New York, just in the past few weeks, authorized one a proposed incinerator. They actually have 10 trash incinerators in that state and have done a great job of keeping it out of the renewable portfolio standards, an anomaly in that they have that many incinerators and don't count them as renewable and actually did a whole report, the state environmental agency did, showing that trash incineration is more polluting per unit of energy than coal, even not per, ener per unit of energy, even just looking at how much mercury they put out versus coal in the state, trash incineration is worse, which is shocking, but per unit of energy is 14 times worse. And even with that history, just a few weeks ago, their agency, NYSERDA, decided that a proposed incinerator that's a gasification type that's being labeled as biomass, but for trash and sewage sludge, can qualify as tier one renewable energy in New York, which is a horrible foot in the door, which could end up bringing in the 10 other incinerators that already exist. Um, one other example of this, which is somewhat related is in New Hampshire, and I'm glad to have just seen that we have some of the folks I'm working with in New Hampshire on the call. Um, John Tuthill and Katie Rejoy and others have been amazing doing work. They're watchdogging the existing wheelbarrow incinerators, one of which in Claremont is now shut down as of a few years ago. But there's one that remains and it's not doing well economically. A lot of them are actually closing down on their own because their economics being so bad. And just um, several months ago, I was working with them in New Hampshire in the state. Um, passed a bill to not just include them in the renewable portfolio standard, but to mandate energy companies buy their energy at a very specific and pre preferable rate of, um, of cost for buying it. And it was the trash incinerator and six biomass or tree burning power plants or biomass incinerators that were getting subsidized now. And we came one vote away from stopping a veto override. So it became law um, the governor vetoed it and the, veto, the legislature overrided that veto um, and only by one vote that was actually a mistaken vote but it still passed. So that is now being challenged by the industry for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and it looks like that law will thankfully be struck down and if so we'll be re-engaging in that fight to make sure that you no know, more efforts to subsidize these dirty plants happen. Um, without these subsidies, these smaller incinerators will most likely close on their own, just like we saw in commerce in Los Angeles and California. Now, some of the work we're doing to force them closed, aside from attacking their subsidies at state levels, is to work in local places like Baltimore, where we've been leading the effort to close down the city's largest air polluter, which is the trash incinerator. It's a wheelbarrow plant. And 46% of all the industrial air pollution in the city, which is heavily industrialized, comes from that one incinerator. And so I wrote the Baltimore Clean Air Act, and that was introduced in late November by a council member who represents the district where this and the nation's largest medical waste incinerator also sits. And the um, actually 13 of 15 council members co-sponsored it. And pretty soon we'll be having hearings on that and hopefully see the legislation be passed as early as February if things go smoothly. Um, they never do, but hopefully this will. And we have the support of the health department. We have the support of the mayor's office. We have broad support in the city to get this passed. And it'll be exciting because this will be the first time that we're getting a local clean air law passed, not to stop proposed facilities, which we've done quite a bit of, but to force closed existing incinerators um, there are also facilities where we're attacking their waste contracts and trying to stop new or renewed contracts from being signed in order to cripple the waste flow for existing incinerators and several other tactics that we're working with um, communities depending on what the situation is. Uh, so finally, I'll just wrap up by saying that um, we have a report that we've been working on on incinerator closures. There are 11 that um, closed since 2011. 
and that's not counting the two more that announced closure this past year or the one that's closed and hopefully will stay closed um, because of generator failures in Hartford, Connecticut, which we're also working on. Um, so we're happy to work with any communities on this or on the alternatives. ILSR has been a great ally to work with in this work. And um, my contact info is on the screen, so feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, and I do uh, know we're getting close on the hour. We had one question that it sounds like uh, was it related to New York. So, Catherine, hopefully um, some of Mike's information there uh, helped you with that uh, question, but feel free to reach out to him or we'll, we'll connect you after the webinar. Um, if folks have other questions, please do chime in to those in the questions box or follow up with any of us after um, the hour today. But I just wanted to end um, quickly before my kind of closing remarks to um, uh, um, ask our panelists if, if I go still on the line as well. Um, Mike, you kind of answer, answered sort of what's on your radar for 2019, but um, in the short term. But yeah, if both of you could just quickly sort of say what, what you're working on currently and what you sort of hope in, in the future. I know we're, um, we'll be hoping to follow additional renewable energy goals and commitments and, and so many more communities are committing to 100% renewables this year that ILSR is really focusing and following those, and if we can raise attention to the inspiration question in some of those commitments, um, it'll be interesting to do. But um, I'll turn it over to Mike or Aiko if, if you are still on the line to answer that question. Aiko? Hey, yeah, sure. Um, I am still online. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think some of the upcoming things that we are working on are mostly expanding our work with the zero waste communities through breakthrough from plastics, um, and also um, also uh, working on you know continuing our failing incinerators project, work with our key partners, and strengthening those relationships and support for our, our partners. Um, additionally, I would say uh, we're we're also working with um, we're building a partnership with some of our uh, partners and allies uh, at the Climate Justice Alliance around. Um, the intersection and connection between just transition and zero waste. And so I'm really excited about that. And um, I'll keep it short. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Mike, was there anything else you're adding aside from Baltimore and that report, for example? Yeah. Um, there are, I think I gave um, a lot of types of things, but I'll, I'll just mention we're working in um, several states. Um, right now in the Hudson, we have nine different facilities just in the Hudson River of New York where we're looking at closing existing facilities, stopping proposals, or stopping the burning of waste in kilns. Um, so there's, there's just a lot going on in a lot of places. Um, we're working in various communities across the country, and one of our goals is to make sure that there's an opposition group to every one of these trash incinerators so we can take them all out and then just move on to stopping all the medical waste incinerators, sludge incinerators, hazardous waste incinerators, and all the things that ought not to be burned. So. If anyone's in any community that has an incinerator or you're not sure, um, please be in touch with me and we'll be glad to work with you building up the strategies around it. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, and yeah, sorry that we didn't have more time for discussion uh, today, but uh, really a lot of great information um, and hopefully uh, informative to all of you and your work. Um, so just to uh, conclude, I wanted to thank our panelists again. Thanks, Mike and Iko, for both joining and taking the time um, and for all of your work um, at Gaia and Energy Justice Network um, in supporting the, the fight against incinerators and um, these journey forms of energy. So uh, very pleased with, um, uh, yeah, hopefully the participation today and, and really uh, just grateful for all of your time. Um, so we look forward to staying in touch. We will be sharing the recording both on our website and then you can find uh, the full report at, at this website on the screen. Uh, feel free to follow uh, me on Twitter or ILSR as well, um, and, and do stay in touch as we um, fight for cleaner waste and, and energy for our local communities in, in 2019. So thanks everyone. I think we'll sign off now. <laughs>